Can you guys can you guys hear me? How's that coming through? Good. Good. Welcome, everybody. Uh, maybe and yeah, we'll just let those people sit down. Welcome. Uh, my name is Paul DeDuke. I'm a faculty member at the uh, Herps Program for Engineering Ethics and Society. I'm also the Director of Engineering Leadership. Welcome to the first Mulakis lecture of this year. We have two every year. Uh, we're very happy to uh, welcome such a, looks like a great crowd tonight. Uh, thanks so much for coming. Um, this is the Mulakis Lecture Series for Responsible Engineering, where we look into the meaning and methods of responsible engineering. Uh, and tonight we have someone very special to help us do just that, uh, Dr. Cynthia Finelli from the University of Michigan. She is Professor of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, Professor of Education, and Director of en ed Engineering Education Research at University of Michigan. She is also a fellow of both the Institute of Electrical and Elect Electronics Engineers, the IEEE, and the American Society of Engineering Education, the ASEE. And she's a member of the governing board of the Research and Engineering Education Network. She previously served as deputy editor for the Journal of Engineering Education. She was associate editor for the IEEE Transactions on Education. She was co-chair of the ASEE Committee on Scholarly Publications and was member of the steering committee for the IEEE ASW Frontiers in Education Conference. Uh, this is a very storied uh, CV. Dr. Finelli founded the Center for Research on Learning and Teaching in Engineering at University of Michigan in 2003 and served as its director for 12 years, Dr. Finelli earned the BSc, MSc, and PhD degrees in electrical engineering from University of Michigan. Please let us uh, welcome Dr. Finelli with a Boulder Buffs round of applause. Thanks for coming. Well, thank you. That was really nice. Um, so thank you so much for coming out tonight. I'm really happy to be here and to be able to share some of my um, experiences in ethics and social responsibility with you. Um, so with that, let, uh, let me start by giving you, can you hear me loud enough? So let me give you a little bit of an outline of what I plan to do for the next 40 minutes or so. Uh, I'd like to start by telling you a little bit about a little bit about my research on college cheating and ethics instruction and the impact of ethics instruction. Um, I then want to sort of pose a different goal for engineering education and give you a couple of examples that I've been engaged with to enact that goal in engineering. And then finally, I'll wrap up and have some time for Q&A at the end of that. So before I get started, I want to just acknowledge some of my collaborators that I've been lucky to work with over the past several years. Um, back in 2001, I began working on a project called the PACES Project and the SEED Project, which I'll tell you about in a little bit. But I had several collaborators that I want to thank and acknowledge um, from that work. Um, then more recently, um, I've started working with some colleagues at University of Michigan on a project that we call the Watchdogs Project, and with some colleagues at University of San Diego um, on a project looking at circuits. And um, I also have been supported financially through this work by grants from the National Science Foundation, so I want to acknowledge them as well. And of course, none of this work would be possible without the um, assistance of all the students, instructors, and administrators who have participated in the research over the years. So let me start by sort of setting the stage for the need for ethics instruction and sort of compare the capacity for ethics instruction versus the demand. Uh, we know that faculty in many cases are challenged with teaching about ethics in the classroom. They often feel overwhelmed with what they need to accomplish in terms of teaching and assessment, and they feel like they don't have the expertise to actually integrate ethics instruction into the classroom. Um, but on the other side, we have ethics crises that we see everywhere, um, including things like um, 
surveillance with drones, um, facial recognition and bias in artificial intelligence. Uh, licensing agencies require that our engineering um, graduates have the abilities to um, think about ethics and integrate them into their work. Accreditation bodies like ABET further sort of underscore the need for ethics instruction. And high rates of student cheating are even further evidence that we need to do something different about ethics instruction in the classroom. Let me tell you a little more about college cheating. Um, a few years back, the in International Center for Academic Integrity uh, surveyed a s whole bunch of uh, students across the country and found that the percent of undergraduate students in college who admit to cheating in any way on an exam is almost a third. It's 32 uh, percent. About a quarter of the students admit to using unauthorized electronic resources for an assignment. 28% said they worked together on an assignment when the instructor specifically asked for individual work. And 15% said they paraphrased or copied from a source without acknowledging it in their work. Wanting to learn more about why engineering students engage in cheating, I launched a project way back in 2001 to really investigate the perceptions and attitudes about cheating among engineering students, which we affectionately called the PACES project. And this was a decade-long project where we were really looking to investigate issues around student cheating and engineering ethics. So we surveyed over 600 students at 11 institutions at a broad range of uh, class levels. We had pre-engineering students at community colleges all the way through senior level and post-senior students. We looked at lots of different kinds of institutions from large public institutions to small private schools and community colleges. And we had institutions from across the globe who were represented in our survey. Um, and we were really looking at different things that might influence students' decisions about whether or not to cheat. Um, we found some very interesting things. We found that the definition that students have about uh, a specific behavior greatly influenced their decision to cheat. So by that I mean if they had a more lax definition of a behavior, they were more likely to engage in that unethical behavior. We found that students' prior level of cheating was a positive indicator of current decisions to cheat. We found that senior level students were more likely to engage in cheating. Students who were on scholarship were more likely to cheat. We found that moral obligation was a unilateral deterrent not to cheat. Um, and we found that students oftentimes said they cheated to alleviate stress. We also found that students um, rationalize their decisions to cheat by these instructor-based neutralizations, like the test was too, too difficult, or the instructor didn't care, or I was just too busy to put time into these things. So we found very high levels of cheating. Um, this example um, really helped underscore some of these ideas. So this student said that the only way to put yourself on an even playing field is to basically engage in the same behavior as my peers. So we realized that these high levels of cheating were disconcerting, and really we were asking the wrong questions. We didn't really want to know why students cheated. What we really wanted to know was what we could do to better promote students' ethical development. So we engaged in the second phase of our study where we um, conducted a series of interviews and focus groups, which ultimately resulted in a survey that we called the Survey of Engineering Ethical Development. So this was the SEED project, which we administered quite broadly across the US um, at 20 different partner schools. We had over 4,000 engineering students um, and 160 faculty and 40 administrators who we worked with throughout this SEED project. And one part of the survey was to create an inventory of ways students received ethics instruction. So we were able to categorize those in terms of the types of pedagogy 
that they received the instruction in and the setting. And we found that primarily presentation by a professor or a guest speaker and discussion with classmates were the most common pedagogies by which students received ethics instruction. And the settings ranged quite a bit from advanced to, en to introductory engineering courses, to courses outside of engineering, to other non-coursework kinds of experiences. One thing that we found throughout these studies was that the quality of the engineering ethics instruction was more impactful than the quantity. Um, this student's example sort of emphasizes this. They said that in this student's case, there was no discussion in one of the courses they received about the bigger impact of engineering. So this course didn't necessarily have a direct impact for this student. On the flip side, this student um, indicated that the professor really encouraged independent thinking and formulating your own opinions, which really helped this student to develop a better ethical um, decision-making process. So one thing we found was that ethics isn't always easy to internalize, and students realize this. Um, this student said, faculty don't really talk about engineers' influence on society and corporate responsibility. So that was something that the student realized as they were engaging in these discussions. We heard other voices that also underscored this idea. Um, this faculty member mentioned that it's really hard to prepare engineering students to operate in a more corporate arena, arena when they get out of their um, courtroom. So I really wanted to learn more, but at this point in my career, I took a detour in what I was doing. I wasn't able to continue with the research I'd been doing. I took a break. Um, I founded the teaching center focused in the College of Engineering at the University of Michigan, and I directed that for 12 years. Um, I also established an engineering education research PhD program. So these two things took a lot of my time and effort, and I had to take a break from doing the ethics instruction. Uh, but then I um, landed a faculty position in the Department of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science, and I was able to connect back after a 15-year hiatus with my research relating to ethics and um, students' professional development. And I started working with a colleague in the uh, Department of Sociology, Professor Aaron Seck, and we began working on a project which was really allowing us to study the impact of ethics instruction on students' ability to be public welfare watchdogs their ability to really keep an eye on things that might have an influence, positively or negatively, on the public welfare, and to be able to intervene in those situations. So in phase one of our project, we engaged um, a survey where we looked at 120 working professionals in the US, and we asked them about the kinds of ethics instruction they had in their undergraduate education, and we asked them about how they might respond in some different ethical scenarios that involved their boss falsifying information about a camera they were designing in their workplace. So we have some interesting findings. Uh, we found that of those uh, working engineers, a third of them said they had received ethics instruction at some point in the ability to recognize their ethical responsibilities. 29% said they had received some sort of instruction about understanding societal consequences. Um, but only 19% said they had received any instruction in being mindful to the responsibilities of the public. Overall, um, our findings in this phase one of our study showed us that having ethics instruction was positively related to um, engineers' ability to recognize different ethical scenarios in the workplace as being significant and uh, occurring in their work. 
It was positively impacted, positively related to engineers not downplaying those ethical situations um, as being common. Engineers that had that sort of training were more likely to be comfortable reporting ethical scenarios when they arose. And they said they would be more, um, they believed their colleagues would respect them if they reported those unethical situations. However, less than a third of the student, or the faculty, sorry, less than a third of the practicing engineers had actually received any instruction as undergrads. So we found basically that ethics instruction in undergraduate education does have a lasting impact. It has these positive impacts here, but it only can have a positive impact when it happens. So with that information, we um, are engaged in a second phase of our watchdogs project in which we're exploring the impact of ethics instruction that might be delivered in different kinds of contexts. So what we've done here is we've surveyed over 500 working professionals in the US, and we've asked them about the ethics instruction they received in four particular contexts. The kind of ethics instruction they had in their classes as undergraduates, in other parts of college, in the workplace, and in their professional societies. And then we've asked how that relates to their understanding of their responsibilities about ethics. So we have preliminary findings. We're still working through some of the statistics of our um, data. But we found that engineers who had ethics instruction in engineering classes are more likely to understand their professional public welfare responsibilities than those who haven't had that training. But we found that ethics instruction at other parts of college and in the workplace has little impact on knowledge of ethical responsibility. We also found that instruction in professional societies has a positive impact, but it isn't very common. And in this study, which is a different sample than I showed you a minute ago, we again found that a third of engineers report never receiving ethics instruction. So with this information, I think we need to really think about a different goal for engineering ethics instruction. So I think we need to really focus on integrating ethics instruction into the classroom, but we also need to infuse in students the sense of social responsibility. I think we need to couple that with an understanding of the responsibilities about public welfare and socio-technical concerns. So this goal of integrating ethics instruction with other social relevant aspects is one that I've been really engaging with lately. And is sort of underscored by this recent comment by Dr. Kadir at UC Berkeley, who says engineers have a key role in creating the physical and regulatory structures that lead to discriminatory outcomes. So ethics for the sake of ethics is really not what we want to do in undergraduate education. We want to link that to all the societal implications that engineers are faced with. So I want to describe briefly two different solutions that I'm looking at to really address this goal. The first is a module for graduate students um, about public welfare responsibilities, which I've been working on with Dr. Sek, and we're piloting with master's students in electrical engineering. And the second is a series of modules for undergraduate engineering students in the Introduction to Electric Circuits class, where we're introducing them to um, socio-technical issues. So the first example is um, this graduate course module for master students in electrical engineering. And these are students who typically have gone off from their undergraduate career, gotten some workplace, workplace experience, and have come back. Um, and the the module that we have here is a two-day module. So before the first day, students read uh, an opinion piece that um, Aaron Seck and I wrote for ASEE PRISM. 
and they complete a survey about the prior ethics instruction they received um, before coming to class. During the first day, the instructor introduces the IEEE Code of Ethics, and the students engage in a discussion about the prior ethics instruction they've had in different contexts. Then between the two class periods, students go off, they reflect on these um, ideas a little bit, and they write about a time when they wish they would have had a little bit more ethics instruction, when some other instruction would have been helpful for them. Then during the second day, the instructor compares the student's prior ethics instruction with what practicing engineers have shared with us. And in class, the students learn about ways that they can be watchdogs for the public welfare, what they could do to intervene if they encounter ethical situations that concern them. And then finally, students go off and they write a public outreach statement that allows them to raise concern about something that might be unethical that they've encountered and then propose a course of action. So the reflections that students posted about their prior instruction are pretty interesting. One student said that what's missing from their prior instruction is an understanding that the non-technical aspects of engineering are really a fundamental part of the core of engineering. This is something that our students often don't see. They have their technical engineering courses, and maybe they never see the coupling of that with the socio-technical uh, aspects. Another student said that ethics wasn't treated as an integral part of the undergraduate education. And a third student said um, that engineers are sometimes confused about the specific kinds of things they can do when they encounter ethical scenarios. So this chart presents a little bit more information about the prior instruction that our students have received. So what we're doing here is I'm comparing the findings for students in blue and the engineers, the practicing engineers in the yellow and orange, and trying to understand if they've received prior instruction in recognizing ethical responsibilities, understanding societal consequences, and being mindful of responsibilities to the public. Um, and then in the three contexts, whether they've received this instruction in undergraduate education, in the workplace, and in the professional society. And we still have a lot of data an to analyze, but what we found <clears throat> is that master's degree students, the students in our master's level course, say that they've seen this in the, primarily in the education that they had private previously. And remember, most of these students have had some prior work experience. But working engineers say they've seen these types of training across all three kinds of uh, contexts, but they haven't seen as much of it. So students say they want a little more instruction, and we ask them to elaborate on when more instruction would have been helpful. And they've categorized, we've been able to categorize those into sort of two main areas. First, they want to know a little bit more about when it's okay to speak up. So for instance, this student noted that for new employees, there was really a sense of urgency placed on them um, especially the, the employees who didn't have a lot of experience. And that resulted in dishonest work being done. So they wanted to know when it's okay to speak up. They also wanted to know more about how to address difficult issues. This student said they wanted just more awareness about the ground level issues that they might encounter and how they could address them. One said they were missing the skill to differentiate between having different opinions or points of view versus being disrespectful and intimidating. So they didn't know how to navigate that situation. And then other students said they wanted to be able to have the skills to identify bias and to um, treat all persons equally. 
So remember, at the conclusion of this two-course graduate module, we asked students to put together an op-ed. And they had really broad range of topics they addressed that were really quite diverse. These three examples illustrate some key points that we saw in the op-eds. So the first uh, example says the government should issue specific rules or laws to limit the use of computer vision technologies and the collection of biometric data to balance privacy issues and public safety and to avoid any types of discrimination. So this is a pretty common theme that we heard among students in the um, op-eds. Another said we can't expect these money-hungry corporations to make moral decisions as they're more concerned about profits than lives. But engineers can make a difference here. By speaking up when our peers are, we can affect positive change. And then third, the students said, the best we could hope for is that every engineer working in the company would be honest to themselves and speak up to their supervisors when they find it necessary. If that doesn't work, the other option is, albeit not ideal, to turn to the media. So we've given these students a chance to kind of practice the behavior of speaking up about something and raising concern when something might be um, can, an unethical situation for them. So I've tried this same uh, activity in a class that I taught in the winter semester for undergraduate students. This was a senior level required course on ethics and professionalism. I had 417 students enrolled. It was a two credit course. Um, and it featured mostly guest speakers who discussed topics like, like life after graduation, entrepreneurship, diversity, equity, and inclusion, and social responsibilities. And at the conclusion of this course, like the previous one, the students were asked to write an op-ed assignment. We have tons of data that we're digging through, but we've been trying to code the data and categorize it. And these are um, some of the key factors that came up about the ethical concerns that students raised. Notice a lot of issues about privacy and security, a lot related to artificial intelligence, um, autonomous vehicles. But students are concerned about things that probably you all are concerned about. This happened in the winter um, just a couple of months ago. Um, this was in the midst of chat, B, chat GPT, a lot of concerns about that as well. Um, but then students also were asked to propose a solution. And they had a quite wide range of proposed solutions, from regulating technology to educating the public to um, holding individuals responsible, decreasing reliance on AI or technology and implementing bans. So we have a long ways to go, but having students practice this activity of writing an op-ed is one way that we can help students think about what they could do in the future if they encounter an unethical situation. Because these situations are things that are not easy to address. You can't necessarily solve it by talking to your boss, but finding ways to raise concern with the public through something like an op-ed could be a really powerful way to make a difference. So we're still piloting these activities in the graduate course and the undergraduate course. We're trying to finish the analysis of the survey data that we have. We're also wrapping up some longitudinal interviews of master's students when they first start our program and then when they move into the workplace to get a sense of what kinds of ethics instruction would really be helpful for them. And our long-term goal is to implement a full semester course that would really focus on these issues. So stay, stu stay tuned for more information on that. I also said that we're designing a series of modules for undergraduate students. And in that case, our goal is to develop materials that would allow undergraduate engineering students to learn more about their social responsibilities. So we know that 
engineering courses are mostly taught from a purely technical perspective, but real problems, the, the grand challenges of the future, require an emphasis on socio and technical responsibilities. But engineering instructors are often challenged with introducing ethics in the classroom or social responsibility in the classroom. They don't have a lot of experience necessarily to draw on. They feel ill prepared to, to bring this material into the classroom. They don't have the time to develop new materials. So our goal is to help instructors by developing some easy to adopt resources for circuits courses. So uh, Professor Susan Lord at University of San Diego and I are working on a project. Um, we're both electrical engineering professors and our goal is to design and test a series of one class session modules that an instructor could bring into their Introduction to Circuits course that help focus on the socio-technical aspects of electrical engineering. We aim to enlist a team of electrical engineering graduate students to help us design these modules. And our goal is also to make them relevant to students in the undergraduate classroom by linking them to students' lives and experience. For example, connecting with mainstream movies or issues in the current news like electric vehicles. We plan to prepare detailed teaching guides for instructors that have a bank of homework and exam problems the instructors could use, detailed lesson plans with class slides and talking points for a particular class session, with the long-term goal of disseminating these modules widely across the country so that it is easy for circuits instructors to bring these ideas into their classroom. We're relying on principles of backward course design, which rely on the fact of the learning objectives, which we will be creating both technical learning objectives and social learning objectives for each module, um, and the instructional activities, the things that the students and the instructors do before class, during class, and after class, and the assessments, like the homework and the exam problems, According to backward course design, all of these things are interrelated and they're very closely coupled. So our first module is relating to conflict minerals. It connects with the basic circuits principle of capacitors and it introduces the societal issues that are connected with um, mining conflict minerals in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Um, those conflict minerals include tantalum, which is mined in the red area of the sub-Saharan part of Africa there. And there is a lot of military presence there, and the, the life for the people in that area is, is very miserable um, because of the mining of these conflict minerals. So we bring this actually to the students in the form of a one class session module. So the learning objectives include technical things like analyzing the capacitors as electric devices, but they also include social issues um, like asking students to be able to define conflict minerals and describe social issues surrounding them or talk about where conflict minerals are used or talk about potential options for engineers who are concerned with the implications of conflict minerals. So these are the learning objectives and they're both technical and social. Uh, in activities in the course include having the stu students learn about and discuss in the class session conflict minerals and what their implications are in terms of societal implications. Students investigate different strategies that are used by companies like Apple um, you know, with a cell phone and other common companies like Microsoft to understand what those companies put in place to try to reduce their reliance on conflict minerals and students present research about conflict minerals policies in class. In terms of assessments, the instructor uh, asks students to complete calculations and do internet research about conflict minerals. 
Students list concerns that they might have about company strategies and they prepare a presentation. So these things are all in the circuits classroom. Um, Susan has conducted these modules in her class session already. She's piloted them and we've gotten some positive student feedback. Um, one student said, the conflict minerals thing made me think differently. You're not just thinking of the circuit itself, but what's making up that circuit, really including the materials and what that means. Another student said, obviously we looked at a lot of stuff that wasn't engineering, including the conflict minerals, which was cool. And that was very clearly engineering, but at the same time, it was very clearly looking at it from different angles. And another student said the conflict minerals thing was huge. One thing I'd never realized was how much one little electric component that's so important can affect like everyone or can affect those people in underdeveloped nations. Kind of a cool way to see like what an EE can do on a positive note. So just yesterday, um, a colleague of mine at University of Michigan in um, circuits launched this module in his class. We had 100 students in, he teaches two sections of our circuits course. One section had, I think, 80 students and the other had about 50 students. And it was a little rocky because the students hadn't been sort of prepared for working in groups and talking about things that were not necessarily related to the technical part of circuits. But it was really exciting to hear some of the students answer some of the questions and you could see the students were really interested in talking about it amongst themselves. And the professor, I think, got a really great conversation going. And the students are now working on investigating these conflict mineral policies of some different companies. And I'll be really curious to see how their reports go next week. So the second module is one that uh, my graduate student, Gracie Judge, developed. Um, and it's base based on electric vehicle batteries. It connects with the basic circuits principle of the voltage divider. And it introduces the idea of the circular economy and societal issues that are related to battery life of electric vehicles. So at the end of their life, the batteries um, that are powering electric vehicles have a lot of energy left in them. They just don't have enough to power electric vehicles. We could just throw them away. Uh, but obviously, that's not a very sus uh, sustainable approach. So what we aim to show them in this module is ways to apply the circular economy to repurpose that battery life when it gets to the end of its ability to power an electric vehicle, how to repurpose that for something else. So the learning objectives, again, include both technical and social, societal um, activities. So students should be able to, after completing this module, design a voltage divider for a DC source, like an end of life battery, um, to illustrate how EV battery packs could be repurposed. They should be able to estimate the energy available in end of life EV batteries. And they should be able to talk about the societal risks introduced by recycling EV batteries or throwing them away that we could instead alleviate by applying the circular economy principles. They listen to a podcast before class and they answer some questions about the circular economy. Um, and then during class, they do some activities that estimate the energy demand that would be available at the end of life for the existing EV batteries on the road. And they think about what that means. And then they learn how the circular economy relates to circuits concepts and EV batteries. And they talk about ways to use the circular economy to re repurpose batteries. In terms of assessments, there are homework and test problems that the instructor can use, which involve having students list different societal risks introduced by recycling batteries, writing about how the batteries can be used um, for repurposed contexts. They could actually do voltage divider calculations to determine the power in a second life EV battery. And they can estimate the energy degradation effects on EV battery repurposing. So we've piloted this in Professor Lord's class. Um, and the students had some interesting things to say. 
They said the module definitely made me consider going into something that does more like with sustainability and stuff like that. One student said I came in hating electrical engineering. Uh, it was just not for me. So I think actually doing the voltage divider and using that for like sustainability purposes and the circular economy was really cool to be actually like, okay, the stuff we're learning is like being used for something. I like that part of it. And I think this last comment is the best. The student said that if we are part of the issue, if we don't decide to fix it. So I think it's really great to be able to connect these basic circuit things that students see every circuits course they take anywhere in the country with something that really motivates students to think more broadly. Next steps for this in, our, in the goal of sort of getting these modules in the hands of circuits instructors across the globe include developing complete teaching guides that we can provide for instructors that include, as I said, um, a bank of homework and exam problems the instructor could use, worked out solutions for those problems, uh, something like a script that the instructor could use with slides so they don't have to become an expert in conflict minerals or EV batteries, uh, and materials that really help the instructor just pick up these ideas and bring them to their classroom. As we launch the modules, we have a series of sort of pilot steps that we intend to use. First, we'll pilot them at a small course at a small private institution. Professor Lord teaches in a, an interdisciplin interdisciplinary engineering program at University of San Diego. UC, USD is a small school. It's a private school, and the courses are very small. So that's sort of a chance to just test these out for the first time through. After that, we intend to introduce these modules into large circuits course that I'll be teaching at University of Michigan. Um, we typically have multiple sections of this course every year. Uh, the plans for how we are going to do the, the module launch didn't quite work out the way we had expected, which is why my colleague uh, taught the conflict minerals modules this semester. Um, but typically, it'll be in my course first and then in my colleagues' courses at University of Michigan after we test them out in my course. And then we aim to engage a lot more institutions at multiple courses across the um, country. As we do this, we will be assessing the impact of our modules at both reinforcing the technical content and the societal content of the modules and at promoting students' sense of social responsibility and we'll do this by looking at the responses that students have on the homework and test exams, uh, test problems, but we also will be surveying them to find out what their social justice attitudes are before the class and at the end of the class, and then throughout their undergraduate career as well. We'll be creating and testing additional modules. As I said, um, we aim to recruit graduate students to help us with designing these modules. So we're hoping to find a cohort of graduate students in electrical engineering who we can um, work with over this coming summer and through the next academic year. Um, that URL is something, if you're interested, you can go to that, whether you're a graduate student or even a faculty member who might be interested in administering these modules down the line. So let me re revisit. Um, the view of engineering that I have. I just want to sort of pose to you. Um, we typically think of, or in the past, I guess, we may have viewed engineering as um, educating somebody in their technical discipline, maybe rocket scientists who would know everything they need to know about their specific discipline, rather than socially conscious engineers who are more concerned with things that go beyond the traditional technical engineering part of their work. So I think we really need to integrate basic ethics instruction with a sense of social responsibility. Uh, and I think that all of us can play a role in that, whether we're students in a course um, aiming to learn more about ethics and, ethics and social responsibility, or we're faculty who are trying to integrate this into our classroom. So on that note, 
I will wrap up here and open the floor for Q&A. I'll just walk around with the microphone and uh, take questions as they come. So, anyone? Testing. Professor Finale, thank you for coming. I really appreciate uh, your, your lecture here. Uh, my question is, um, that while well, it's become more and more clear to me, at least, that a university's primary objective regarding an undergraduate engineering education seems to be to create an end product that is attracted to an engineering company. Um, so, so let's say that the ethics modules are successful when we create engineers who are more conscientious of social tec uh, technical issues, which I think is very admirable. Um, how, are the com how are companies going to respond to this new cohort of engineers that maybe they push back against their directives, maybe they go to the media, write op-eds. I think that these are the types of engineers that we want, but the companies and the universities are, are very closely linked. I'm curious what your uh, opinion on how, the comp how companies would react to these types of engineers that we would create would be. Yeah, yeah, thanks, you're right. I think that it, this is sort of a double-edged sword because on one hand, employers are looking for students who have a sense of ethics and their responsibility to the profession. Um, yet on the other hand, if they become too conscious about social responsibility, it might push back on some of the uh, companies' work that they're doing in other places. Um, so I think there might potentially be some pushback from companies. But I also think that, as you say, it's, it's really incumbent on us and important for, I think, really the future of society to be able to voice concerns in this way. And I think by preparing engineers to have a, an informed way to do this, an approach that is likely to lead to positive impact, to, to like equip engineers with these skills, I think it will make companies better prepared to address the issues that come up from society. So without having the engineers in the workplace who are prepared to address these concerns, then the concerns will still come up, but there won't necessarily be an appropriate response to them. So I think it might be hard for companies initially, but I think companies will, will be looking for ways to have appropriate responses. So I think it'll be taken up by employers. Next question. Others? Testing. Um, you mentioned earlier about like, um, Wanting to wanting students to develop their like own ethical framework, um, do you think it's bad if students develop an ethical framework that contradicts, for example, like their university's code of conduct? That's a good question. Um, so, I do I think it's bad if students develop an ethical framework that contradicts the code of conduct of the university. I don't think it's bad necessarily. I think it's good if the student develops an ethical framework that they can use as a lens to address issues that concern them ethically. Um, it might, it could potentially be that a, the code of conduct of university is designed in such a way that there's conflict. I think more likely than not, the code of conduct would overlap with the framework of ethics, but it, I don't think it's bad if they don't, because I think it's really important that the student have some sort of framework to rely on. Um, I can't think of an example of a situation where the code of conduct would be, and uh, like, 
opposed to any ethical framework. Can you think of an example in particular? Would you mind elaborating? Yeah, um, I, I can think of an example, but I guess the res my response would be like, um, what do you what do you suggest students do like if their ethical framework contradicts the code of con conduct? I mean, one example I can think of is like if you're in a class of like a thousand students and you've got like an upcoming test that you haven't studied for, it seems that like maybe if you looked at it from like a utilitarian perspective, you, one person cheating on that exam is not going to like produce a whole lot of negative utility versus you getting a good grade might impact your uh, GPA and your life a lot I more. See. So by ethical framework, oh, I see what you mean. Um, I mean, I guess that's the student needs to struggle with that situation because I think the ethical, I was thinking you meant ethical framework as a way to, I mean, I would say that the framework of the, engaging in unethical behavior in that specific context, even if you could rationalize a reason for doing it, is still an unethical behavior, and it would be opposite to the code of conduct for the university. So I think the student is not behaving within the ethical framework of making ethical decisions. So I. I guess I would challenge you in thinking that that is a, a framework of engaging in ethical decision making. Anybody else? Thank you. Um, I have a question for what options do engineers in industry have to fight against unethical practices of businesses without having to worry about being fired? That's really hard. And this, this is exactly why we're trying to work with the practicing engineers and the master's students in our engineering programs to figure out what situations they might encounter and what kinds of tools we can provide for them. Um, in some cases, you might be able to speak up to your boss. But you're right, in many cases, it's a fine line between <laughs> maintaining your position and raising a call to action. Um, I think there are ways that you could maybe anonymously write an opinion piece for the newspaper or social media or something. But I think you're right, depending on your vulnerability in the position, um, you might be less able to be forthcoming in the concerns that you have. You could maybe talk to a colleague, and collectively you could come up with a solution. But newer employees are often at a disadvantage in terms of the vulnerability of their career. And they oftentimes have less ability to like, raise a call to action. So that's exactly what we're trying to think through, is what kind of tools can we provide students with who are soon to be professionals so that they can feel more comfortable. And I think to date, really, the thing that we've really been pushing on is opinion pieces and, and you know, raising issues about policy or maybe doing it anonymously, but, but finding a way to at least raise concerns so that more people are aware of them. Testing. Um, thanks. This was great. So, um, as a, a faculty member in the college, um, you know, there, I think this stuff is so valuable and so important to sort of include in engineering education. Um, but you typically get kind of pushback from faculty members who sort of say there is just not time to add one more thing to my class. Um, and so, I was wondering if you could sort of speak to maybe challenges you have faced, maybe either administratively or just with individual faculty, sort of finding space for this stuff? How have you navigated that? You know, um, if maybe there's students here who kind of want to rally for maybe more ethical content, like what tool should they use potentially? That's a big one. I mean, I, I have spent a lot of my past time in faculty development trying to really promote faculty adoption of evidence-based teaching practices. And, and always there are 
barriers that come up about time. There's just not enough time in the class. There's so many things in the content of the class that you can't afford to give up anything. Um, I mean, I guess I would push back. I have pushed back in many of those situations and really challenge the faculty to look more carefully at their syllabus because I think there always is something that could give a little bit. But I do acknowledge that. Um, I mean, in teaching my courses, I have a certain amount of things I really want to get through, which is one of the key reasons that we've really tried to make these undergraduate course modules be small so that an instructor could just pick up one of them and tack it on to the time when they're talking about capacitors. So they don't have to give up talking about capacitors. They don't have to give up three class periods to talk about ethics. It's just bringing these pieces in at an opportune moment in the curriculum so that if I do it in my class and somebody else does it in their class, at least students might see two or three examples during their entire curriculum as an undergrad. Uh, and that might just help students become more acclimated to these ideas. But it is definitely a heavy lift. Um, I mean, there are plenty of faculty in my department who will probably not be open for this. But I'm trying to you know, convince some of my colleagues that it's worth their time and effort. So we are trying to like test it out and make it really easy for faculty. And I mean, I guess I would just say, keep trying. <laughs> Um, somebody here had a question. Oh, can we come back to her in a minute? Uh, yep. Yeah. Next. Yeah. So I'm coming at it probably more from the practitioner side. So I'm a. I, I, could you speak louder? I oh, hear. sorry. Can you hear that? Sure. Okay. I'm coming at it more from the 30 plus year practitioner side. So hopefully it can uh, address some of the students. Um, one of the things I think you see coming in, in it, being younger, it's what you may be calling unethical or some of it, I think there, there's a lot of balancing perspectives and things in a corporation you've got to balance back and forth. You can't necessarily look at it like an NGO as a single issue group that says, this is the one thing that's the most important in the whole wide world and that's what I'm gonna focus 100% on. You're balancing a lot of different pieces and sometimes you don't get the perfect answer, you've got to get an answer that works the best within a framework. It's that Venn diagram you showed. You know, There's a lot of different things you've got to balance. So I think it's really good to raise it. And you know, we still do this. We're looking at social license to operate. We're looking at broader consumers, even within Fortune 500 companies. That's, you know, we're, we're concerned with that. But I think don't jump, to, don't jump to the conclusion too quickly that your boss is being unethical or the company is being unethical. There's some things you're just going to have to balance out and you get the best answer you can that's not the perfect answer. Things are rarely black and white in the real world. And it's a lot of blurry lines. Thank you. Thank you for this talk. Uh, really interesting stuff. And I was curious, you know, for faculty would faculty to adopt some of these modules, even as low hanging as they are. Um, I'm curious because a lot of faculty have not gotten good ethical instruction themselves. And so I'm, you know, thinking about those surveys and some of the survey results, you know, is part of the barrier to entry even our familiarity with ethics instruction and how comfortable are we leading ethical discussions having had no training to actually do so? Yeah. And I'm curious, yeah, any plans there? Definitely. I mean, I think, I don't think the best solution is to educate faculty about how to be ethics instructors. I think that is a lot to ask of faculty. And I know a lot, I never had any ethics instruction as a, I mean, we have so little instruction on how to teach at all, let alone how to teach ethics. Um, but I think that, again, that's sort of why we really want to make these modules something they can just pick up and bring in. And it's not requiring them to learn about, you know, systems of ethics or moral obligation. But really it's, and I, I know that's a major concern that faculty often have is they don't have the tools. But yesterday when my colleague taught this session, it didn't require him to do anything about ethics. It just had, he had some slides that said, here is where the DRC is, here are some major issues that happen, here is the, uh, the tantalum that comes from these minds Let's do some calculations. How much tantalum is actually being used in all the cell phones in the country or whatever? 
and what can we do to reduce our reliance on tantalum? So it, in it, we gave him some, here are some things that might come up as answers. Here are some things that students might question. Um, here are some resources you can look at. But he, he didn't take much time to learn the material in advance. Um, we asked, you know, there's, it's a lot of connection with Black Panther. So student, I mean, there's, it's interesting to the students, and there's a lot of discovery and learning that the students have with the instructor. So it, it is a little intimidating, to be sure. But the instructor did a pretty good job of it without learning too much extra stuff. Um, I see some interesting parallels between that and some of the diversity conversations, yeah. as well as how to teach that, right? Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think this is, yeah, really interesting. My final question, I guess, is um, do you ever have to convince your colleagues that engineering is socio-technical and not oh, just definitely. technical? Definitely. <laughs> Absolutely. I think, yeah, so not only getting the students to understand that there's more to engineering than math in the technology part, I, they get that perspective because they hear it from the faculty. Um, so without bringing some of that societal stuff into the classroom and convincing faculty that they should do it, um, it it's definitely both the faculty and the students have this belief um, in socio-technical dualism. Yes. Hi, Cindy. Thank you. That was fabulous. Um, I'm going to follow up on Janet's question that was over there, and especially around this idea that you know, our faculty don't know how to teach ethics. And the, and I'm really curious if you all have done work in terms of the language being used. So we talk about this in terms of leadership, the number of faculty who don't think they teach leadership, don't know leadership, but it's because they also don't understand the frameworks of leadership. So they don't realize they're already doing this many times in group-based activities and teamwork. And a lot of times what you'll see in a capstone class is actually that framework. And I'm wondering how much the same thing is happening though in ethics and whether you all have looked at this in terms of, we do talk about risk, we do talk about safety, we do talk about impact of works, right? However, not all faculty would stop and step back. And I even noticed like when you take a look at how you set up the classes, that not all faculty would even know what they are actually talking about in class, or students even know that these are ethical considerations, right? Yeah, so being explicit about some of these ideas is, is a, it's a step in the process. Um, sort of it, paralleling back to the diversity conversation. It, I was, that's, because I had that on my mind too, um, diversity as well as we see it with bystander training. Yep. It's a lot of the same recognizing that it's happening, having a tool set to be able to go to, having the vocabulary that goes behind it, but in many ways, I also wonder, we also even say, like, when people say ethics, everybody shuts down because there's a negative connotation with it many times. And also, is that part of one of our other barriers? The language we're using, sometimes people don't even know they're teaching it. And then the other one is that there is a idea that ethics and if I'm doing something, it's unethical, then somehow, or even considering it, it may be bad. So therefore, I don't even want to talk about it or think about it. So and normalizing the conversation. Normalizing the conversation. Yeah. And I think this is one thing that we, I noticed a lot 10 years ago at University of Michigan around diversity. Because in the role that I had in faculty development, engineering faculty didn't want to talk about diversity. But they were talking about teamwork all the time. Um, so it's very similar. And then with ethics, I think you're right. Instructors are bringing a lot of these ideas that are related to ethics into the classroom without realizing that it's, it's, it's a pseudo way to talk about ethics. So I think bringing these conversations up and having broader awareness about them is definitely a step in the process. Yeah, thank you. Yes. Hi. Um, so in some of my courses, it's a more specific question, but we're starting to, for the first time, address the issues of AI and whether or not you can use it in coursework. And my classes take very different approaches. Some ask we don't use it at all. Some ask that we do use it. What are your takes on the use of tools such as chat GPT? And if it is allowed, how do we, for lack of a better term, police it or monitor it? As, I guess, teachers, as students, um, what's the best way to deal with Using AI in That's coursework. such an open question right now. Um, when I taught that senior level course in the winter, 
nobody really heard anything about ChatGPT at the beginning of the semester, but my TA said, we should put something in the syllabus that says students can't use ChatGPT. And I'm like, what's that? By the end of the semester, it was all over everything. And we didn't have anything in the syllabus. Um, so it, it is definitely an open question. And there's so many workshops and seminars at University of Michigan, every time you turn around about how to use generative AI in the classroom. So I don't have an answer, but I do think that we need to leverage generative AI as much as we can, because students are going to use it. Um, so maybe finding a way to help them use it in productive ways, um, like have them create an outline of a paper and turn that outline in, and then ask them to use AI to create an introduction and then show how they would refine the introduction. I mean, I, I don't know. I haven't taught a class yet which is requiring much of a writing component. Um, I think that's where I most, or I feel it could be used mostly. Although the course I'm teaching now has a heavy reading assignment. And one of my students said, here's this new tool where I can just throw this article into, J, uh, into generative AI and it gives me a summary and I don't even have to read it. And so I'm like, well, that's good. <laughs> I'm going to use it. Um, so I don't know. I, I don't really have an answer yet, but I feel like we really have to find a way to leverage it in the classroom versus policing it in the classroom. That's one thing that was a key takeaway from my original work on ethics and cheating is that rather than policing cheating and finding ways to make it impossible to cheat, students will find ways that we don't want to just find ways to make them not cheat. We want to help them be more ethical. So we want to make, make it so they don't want to cheat. Um, so how can we do the same thing with AI? I don't know the answer. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I just wanted to ask, kind of relating to AI, what is your like ethical standpoint on it? I know you said like in, like um, leveraging it instead of uh, policing it, but like generally with uh, writing and whatnot. I know you're not a writing teacher, but um, what, what would you be your personal opinion on that? I think it's it's here with us. We're, we we can't get away from it. So I think. I think it's unethical to turn in an assignment that's written by generative AI without acknowledging it. Um, but I don't think it's unethical to, I, I haven't ever used it, so I haven't figured out how I might use it yet, but I, my students, my graduate students I know, have used it to help with better English. So they might put in the first draft of their introduction or something and then find a way to smooth out the English a little bit. Um, so I think that there are ways you can use it ethically as long as you acknowledge that you're using it rather than hiding it and claiming credit for the work that's produced by AI as your own. Where, where's the mic? Do you have the microphone? Oh, yeah, fine. Uh, yeah, <laughs> I do. Um, I don't know if you said this in your presentation or not, but are you implementing these courses to freshmen or to older undergraduates like seniors? And if so, do you think that it would make them more like ethical to have it young, like freshman year? So the, the two kinds of things we're looking at, one is the set of modules that we specifically were originally targeting for graduate students. Because right now, at least in our program, there's like no ethics instruction for graduate students. So we wanted to prepare them. And we're bringing that to the senior students. But I think students at every level need to have some sort of instruction about what they can do. Um, right now, in our first year courses, there is some ethics that's taught in the first year courses. Um, and there's a little taught in the senior courses. But yes, for sure, that needs to be brought down sooner. But the circuits courses at our university are taught. Sometimes students take them at the end of their first year or the beginning of their second year. So those modules that bring in the socio-technical content would be, in this case, for the, 
first slash second year. But I really think it's important to see it every semester of your career as a student. Um, right now, we're just tackling circuits and the senior slash master's level courses. But the long-term eventual goal is to find ways to get it to all students. I think it would be unethical not to introduce students at all levels to some sort of socio-technical work. Thank you. Yeah. I just was wondering uh, if you had any examples of the societal consequences that you had mentioned in your slides. Um, sure. Um, so one of the societal implications of AI, uh, facial recognition bias, um, is that like sometimes uh, dark skin, African American skin, can be totally missed in facial recognition. Um, there was an example that we talked about in the se senior level course where um, the, the policing algorithms in a certain area in a city were designed uh, based on a whole bunch of faces that they had gathered over many, many years that were collected by the cameras. So they trained the cameras based on the faces in the images, but they were missing African-American faces or vice versa. So in any case, the tr algorithms totally were trained to not be able to recognize certain kinds of faces. So there's a lot of bias in facial recognition. Um, there are societal implications associated with like surveillance in cameras and drones, um, whether or not it should be okay for people to be surveilled when they don't know that they're being watched. Um, the implications of the fact that the tantalum is mined in places in underdeveloped countries and we're taking advantage of the, the poor. Those are some examples. Well, they're not necessarily unethical. I mean, okay. uh, people had no idea that some of these things were happening until we start digging in. Um, so I don't know that it's necessarily the same thing as being unethical, um, but it does result in things that if you start examining the results, the results might be unfair or maybe unethical. Yeah. Um, so you going back to AI and like how students use it to cheat. I, I can't hear you. Can you? You were in the microphone, but I just okay. could you speak a little louder? Okay, going back to the AI and like students using it to cheat and how faculty also plays a role in this because there's certain like professors that just don't care or aren't like. I guess the best at um, teaching their courses, could that be like a way to justi justify students using AI to like help them? Could it be a way to justify students using AI to help them learn when the instructor's not teaching well? Yeah. Yeah. Um, yes, I think it probably could. I mean, if so if the instructor is teaching about dynamics and they're doing a horrible job at it and you ask chat gpt to tell you the top three things to know about dynamics that's a great way to leverage ai in in your learning as a student so i think that would be a perfectly legitimate way to use ai or even if the instru instructor were maybe doing a great job but you just missed that one piece i think there's a you know there's a lot of benefit to using artificial intelligence to focus on the issues that you're maybe a little more lost on in the teaching. So I think that'd be a fine way to use AI. Um, your studies seem to look at the ethical teaching in higher education. How significantly do you think ethical frameworks developed prior to college can uh, could be you, I'm sorry, could oh. you speak a little closer <clears throat> to the microphone? Your studies seem to look at the ethical teachings in higher education. How significantly do you think ethical frameworks developed prior, college, prior to college can be affected by these classes? Because as I see it, the issue is reaching students who wall off the idea of exploring, exploring gray areas in favor for their preconceived black and whites. 
and wanting to do something is different about unethical issues is different than simply requiring students to learn about them. I'm not sure I got your question. Are you saying? I couldn't quite hear everything you were saying. Um, it was kind of two part. Um, how significantly do you think the classes and ethical uh, teaching ethical frameworks in college can affect prior ethical framework develop uh, ethical frameworks developed? So how can we like circumvent something that the student learned previously, which was not correct? Um, not so much that more, um, like the, com um, disrupting the comfort, comfort, comfortability and, um, in their, like, ah. Oh. So maybe they learn black and white. They learn a... black and white prior to college and they're very comfortable in that. How do ah. these classes affect that? Because as I see it, the issues tearing down, um, their comfortable, how comfortable they are with their ethics rather than. Um, simply teaching them about like the issues going on. So I think you're saying maybe students coming in prior to college see things as right or wrong, or they, they believe that there is a right or wrong answer when they will encounter an ethical scenario. But in real life, there's very rarely black and white. So I think helping them maybe struggle with some of those gray issues and for example, bringing case studies about different ethical scenarios to a class, which aren't black and white, and having students discuss both sides and the pros and cons of different decisions that might be made in a given situation. Um, I'm not sure I'm answering your question. Yeah. I, it's a complicated question for me to, like, Simplify into uh, a few sentences. I'll ask after, maybe. Okay, thank you. Hi, I'm back. Um, <laughs> you, back. you talk. You talked a lot about um, like struggling to like convince uh, engineering faculty and like um, that like this is important and struggling to like get them to learn how to teach ethics. Have you considered bringing in like philosophy professors or like social science professors to teach the ethics in engineering at all? Yeah, yeah, so I think, I don't know a lot about the Herbst Center here, but as I understand it, it's kind of that with ethics, people who are informed about ethics being integrated in the engineering college. That seems like an ideal model. What doesn't work, which we saw in our previous studies, is when you have students in the College of Engineering taking coursework, and they have to go to the other campus to take a class in the Department of Moral Philosophy to satisfy their, their ethical education requirement and then come back. It's totally disconnected. So I think bringing in moral philosophers or, or people who are more informed about ethics instruction, if it's done in the right way, I think can be pretty powerful. And actually at University of Michigan we have, I'm trying this bringing modules into the classroom where the instructor can use that information directly. A colleague of mine is trying to talk about moral and ethical instruction by him going to his colleague's classes. He's an aerospace engineer. And he's going into other aerospace engineering classes as an aerospace engineer, teaching some of these ideas. So we're trying to actually compare to see if having the instructor of the course talk about socio-technical content, how that compares to having another instructor come in and talk about issues about moral and ethics. Um, but I think both can be really helpful and productive. It just can't be a separate extra thing that the students go somewhere else to do and come back, because the students will see through that. They'll see that it's not integrated. You just have this add-on thing, so it doesn't really have the same value. So I think it can be done, yeah, yeah. So from your presentation and your answers from the questions, alongside with teaching ethics in your class, would the training of the class also teach how to use AI as a tool necessarily, not to fear AI, but to use it to advance people's learning? Um, 
Well, I don't, yes, I think it is important for the instructor to have a plan for how to leverage AI in their teaching. I don't necessarily think every instructor will be prepared to tell students or to teach students about how to do that. I, I really don't know how we will, I mean, I don't even know how I'm gonna leverage it in my classroom, so I can't imagine how I could tell other faculty to leverage it in their classroom. But I do think that it's a, probably when the cell phones came out, faculty were struggling with these same things. What are we gonna do about cell phones? Everybody has cell phones. How are we ever gonna figure out what to do with this? Can we ban them from the classroom? But we now have ways to leverage it by having students use it for poll everywhere or clickers or whatever. So I don't know what the future holds for AI, but I do know we are not gonna be able to ignore it. I don't know how we're gonna integrate it yet though. So I don't have an answer for you yet. Hi. Oh, I have a question that, like I've seen a lot of bias about like the difference of importance of ethics and like technical, the technical side of engineering. Can you speak into the microphone? Oh, I heard you so yeah, far. Sorry. Yeah. So like what I'm saying is that um, I've seen a lot of people, for example, like skip their ethics homework to like do physics homework instead and things like that. So like I was trying to like find like how can you convince someone of the importance of ethics? Like how can someone as an individual like benefit from learning ethics? I think that a key to helping people see the importance of ethics is as faculty and as colleges for it to be important. So weaving it through every part of the curriculum and not having it be the ethics homework, but having it be the circuits homework, which also has some ethical components in it. So integrating things together, I think is gonna be pretty critical. Uh, I, I don't know beyond that. Yeah, thank you. All right, one more question we have to get uh, Dr. Finelli to dinner, so <laughs> this is important. Last question to you. So kind of adding on to what he was saying, wouldn't it be more effective to have this kind of course in ethics before college and be kind of uh, brought into all majors instead of just engineering? Well, more effective than, I mean, I think it's important to have People thinking about ethics everywhere, all the time. So in high school, we should be talking about it. We should be talking about it in engineering. We should be talking about it in liberal studies courses, ideally. But the uptake of ideas like this isn't gonna be 100%. So the next best thing would be to have pockets of people bringing it up in their courses. Um, but I think, as I said before, the key really is to have kind of a sustained conversation going throughout a student's, well, throughout a person's life. But what we can influence now is through the student's undergraduate or graduate education. Yeah, well, I think it's hard to teach a class on something that doesn't have like defined parameters. Um, so I think maybe a class that just brings more awareness about what is going on in the world and maybe do it before college in general and say, you have to complete this before you can go to college. So you kind of leverage the importance uh, of going to saying. college while also leveraging how important ethics is in society. That's a possible part of the solution. So I think you're saying something like a module that a student would have to do during orientation or something before or they summer. get to college. Um, yeah, I think that would be a useful step in the process for sure. Um, I haven't seen it done. I imagine there are places that are trying something like this, so I'd be curious to see how it goes. Thank okay, you. Thank you. All right, guys, this was an engaging, uh, very interesting conversation. Let's give Dr. Finelli a final round of applause. Thank you for coming out. Hopefully we'll see you in the spring.